ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's talk. It's about uh, implementing a do-it-yourself debugger on Wi-Fi chips. Who of you ever ask yourself how debuggers are implemented internally? At least some. So what I will be talking about is how to implement a debugger on your own on a bare metal device that is uh, based on ARM Cortex-R4 processors. Those are four examples used in Broadcom full Mac Wi-Fi chips that are, for example, installed in Nexus 5 smartphones. Basically, all the ideas you get here, you can also uh, port to, to other Cortex-R4 devices because the debugging core in those devices is actually installed in, in all of these hardware components. Uh, you will learn something about how to set and use hardware breakpoints. Um, I have a little, um, yeah, demo about uh, memory watch points. You will learn how to handle exceptions on those processors, uh, what kind of operating modes there are on those chips, and you will see a lot of assembly in the end. But um, yeah, it shouldn't disturb you too much, I hope. Um, to patch those Wi-Fi chips, uh, Daniel Wegemer already introduced the Nexmon framework. It's a C-based firmware patching framework. We developed especially for patching Wi-Fi chips. But as you saw, it can also patch firmware for other devices. Um, at the end, I will shortly introduce it so you have an idea about it. So let's uh, start first by looking into smartphones. For example, the Nexus 5 smartphone. We already know that there are apps running on those phones. Um, they have a Linux kernel to communicate with the hardware. And in the case of the Nexus 5, there is a Broadcom BCM4339 Wi-Fi chip. And this Wi-Fi chip, like any other Wi-Fi chip, has a physical layer to um, modulate signals and demodulate them on reception. It has a certain hardware core to do low-level hardware control, for example, to do real-time processing, like answering acknowledgments on time or drop frames that are incorrectly received and stuff like this. Then, as it is a full Mac chip, it contains the Mac sublayer management ent entity. It controls everything like connecting to an access point, authenticating you, and everything Wi-Fi related. So if you had a soft Mac chip, this would be implemented in your driver and the operating system. But as it is a full Mac chip, it's implemented in the firmware of the chip. And then for the operating system, the chip just looks like an Ethernet to Wi-Fi bridge. Of course, you can control some Wi-Fi parameters, but the frames you pass to the Wi-Fi chip are always Ethernet frames, and the chip um, does anything to convert them into Wi-Fi chip. Of course, there's some interface to the host, and if we now assume that an app wants to communicate over Wi-Fi, it can generate some kind of TCP or UDP traffic, it uh, sends it to the Linux kernel where it is uh, packed into Ethernet frames, then they are passed to the Wi-Fi chip. Um, there they were converted into Wi-Fi frames, um, passed on to the physical layer where they are transmitted as some kind of a analog signal. So the thing here is um, if you want to learn more about Wi-Fi chips, how Wi-Fi operates and stuff like this, or if you want to change the firmware running on this kind of chip, it, it makes sense to understand how the firmware works and how we can change it and replace it. So first of all, um, this uh, Ethernet to Wi-Fi bridge and the MLME runs on an ARM microcontroller. And the ARM microcontroller in this case has uh, two memories. One is a read-only memory. The other one is a um, um, read and writable memory. So one part of the firmware of the Wi-Fi chip is always stored in the ROM part, and another part of the firmware is loaded by the driver into the RAM. And after the chip is starting, it will directly start executing the firmware from the RAM, and this firmware can also call functions from ROM. So if you ever wanted to extend the functionality of your Wi-Fi chip, you can just modify the firmware that is loaded by the driver to add new functionalities. So now the first step to, to understand what the Wi-Fi chip is actually doing is to extract the, the ROM firmware. Um, 
um, also take the RAM firmware, somehow put them together, and then analyze them in some kind of a disassembler or decompiler. Then based on the analysis, we can, for example, figure out where functions are and uh, what kind of yeah, parameters need to be passed to those functions and so on. And then we can create firmware patches based on this information, combine those firmware patches with the original firmware file and load this patched firmware file into the Wi-Fi chip to run our own Wi-Fi firmware, which is pretty nice, I think, as a first start. And uh, there were some other projects uh, in advance that already did something like this. It was the MonMob project, uh, mainly focusing on Broadcom chips for Apple devices. And then there was a talk at Recon 2013. It was um, about uh, BC Mon, which actually reverse engineered the firmware to implement uh, monitor mode and frame injection on, yeah, at this time, newer um, Wi-Fi chips. And what we wanted to do together with Daniel Wegemeyer was first to get monitor mode and frame injection running on Nexus 5 smartphones. So, but to do this, we had to analyze the firmware. Of course, if you, if you have IDA, for example, it is a static um, firmware analysis tool. So it can sometimes be tedious to analyze firmware statically. Sometimes it makes more sense to do it dynamically. For example, if you want to if there are some indirect jumps, so you might have a structure that stores a callback table with certain function pointers and you are calling them. The structure is only initialized during runtime, so it might make sense if you could uh, analyze the firmware while it is running and see how the memory changes and, and so on. So the thing here is um, how can we do this dynamic debugging? Um, First thing we figured out is uh, the R microcontroller running in the chip is a Cortex-R4 processor. So we took a look into the technical reference manual. And according to the manual, each of those processors has a debugging core with dedicated hardware, breakpoints, and watchpoints. So the regular way to access this debugging core is through a JTAG port on which you can connect an external debugger. Unfortunately, the, the PCB where this chip is installed in the Nexus 5, it doesn't expose the pins for the JTAG port. So we were not able to use it for our debugging purposes. So the thing we did next uh, was to, to figure out uh, if there are any alternatives how to access the debugging core. Let me start with a little example about a program. So here you have a very simple assembler program. It is just we do not really need to care what it is doing in detail, but it's just moving stuff between registers, adding them together, and then branching back. It's a loop to, to implement something. Now, if you wanted to debug it in your famous debugging program, you would just uh, double click on the line to set a breakpoint, and then you do not care what happens internally. You just want it to debug. But I ask myself, what is actually happening internally when you set a breakpoint? and how is it handled. So the first thing when, you, when your program counter points at the address of an instruction with a breakpoint, there are two possible modes to uh, use the debugger. The first is called halting debugging mode. That is what you normally use with an external debugger. So the whole control of your, of your microprocessor is passed to uh, an external debugger. The other mode which you might know from debugging software and operating systems like Windows or Linux or whatsoever, um, is that instead of halting the processor, you are just raising an exception, which is something like an interrupt. And then you can handle this interrupt directly on the same platform on which the program runs that you want to debug. So we already know that the first part doesn't work as we do not have access to the JTAG port, but we can still implement the debugger in the, in the second option. So next question is what happens if one of those debugging exceptions is triggered? So according to the technical reference manual again, um, at the beginning of 
all those uh, firmwares, there is uh, a vector table, and the vector table contains commands that, uh, yeah, that actually describe what should be done when a certain exception occurs. So for example, when you first start up your chip, it will be the reset, reset exception. And it just tells you which is the first uh, branch instruction that will be called when you start your chip. So when you hit a breakpoint, it is a so-called prefetch abort exception. So before we prefetch the command from memory, we are actually jumping to this point here. So our program counter moves to this point and is then executing this branch instruction. Some other things we have to, to learn about this is uh, processor operating modes, because whenever you call an exception, your processor will also change the internal mode. So again, according to the manual, there are a couple of processing modes. We are only interested in two of them. First is the system mode. This is the regular mode, the processor or the uh, firmware processor for those Wi-Fi firmwares already runs in. The other mode is the abort mode. So whenever an abort exception occurs, we change into this abort mode. Why do we actually have those two modes? I will explain you shortly. Just to indicate in which mode we are, I just changed the color of the, the program counter. So if it's blue, we are in abort mode. If it's green, we are in system mode. So what are the difference be differences between the two modes? You can see it here when you look at the banked registers. So in ARM thumb mode, you have uh, 15 registers that you are normally using. Um, the last one, register 15, is the program counter. Then there is a stack pointer, and then there is a link register. Link registers you normally use to store the return address after doing a branch. So as you can see here, whenever you switch uh, the, the operating mode from system mode to abort mode, you will exchange the registers the stack pointer and the link register are pointing at. So by, by doing this, you can have a separate stack and a separate link register for your debugging application handling the abort mode. And do not disturb the values stored in the registers um, for the system mode, which is pretty nice for, for debugging without disturbing the original state of your program. So those are the two changes here and I already marked them here. The nice thing about it is you can now just call functions from your, um, yeah, from your debugging mode by just using the new abort uh, uh, register for the link register, for example, and you have a separate stack that is not disturbing any state of your original stack. So next thing is, uh, how does the uh, prefetch abort handler look like? So this is um, a prefetch abort handler close to the original firmware running on the Wi-Fi chips. First, it does some instruction we don't care about. Then there is a the next instruction. It is the, called the store return state instruction. It can push the link register and the... Um, the, the processor state register onto the stack, and you can even be define on which stack it should be pushed on. So as you can see here, the, the value 1F indicates that it should be pushed onto the, the stack of the system mode. So the next instruction is a, a change processor state instruction, and it, with this one you can define um, how to change the, the operating mode, for example, from abort mode to system mode. And as I already mentioned, the Broadcom firmware normally all, always runs in system mode, so it always wants to exit the abort mode and go back into system mode, which is done here. So we are now back in system mode and continue the, the execution of the firmware. So the, the next question is, um, um, the next thing actually I have here is uh, are a couple of to-dos that we need to uh, go through to implement a debugger. It is somehow the outline for the next some uh, slides that I will present. First thing we need to do is to, to stay in abort mode and not switch to, um, to, to system mode. The next thing is uh, we also need to save the register state onto the abort mode stack. Uh, by doing this, we have to keep in mind that the 
um, the stack pointer for the abort mode was never in initialized before, so we have to initialize it on our own. Then we need to analyze the handle exceptions function to figure out what the firmware does to, to handle exceptions in detail. And then we need to implement some kind of a breakpoint handler, and then we also need to activate breakpoints. So let me continue with the, the first step, which is pretty simple. To uh, stay in abort mode, we can just uh, knob the instruction that is changing into system mode. And the other instruction is also very easily changed. So instead of pushing the uh, register state uh, onto the stack of the system mode, we can just uh, change the value here to push them onto the abort mode stack. So the next thing is uh, handling, um, the next thing is initializing the abort mode stack. So a good option to do this is at the start of the firmware at the very beginning, because maybe we want to also debug something at the very beginning during firmware execution, so it makes sense to initialize the abort mode point as soon as possible. Therefore, we just uh, look into how to handle the a reset of a chip, which will tell us how, to, how the chip boots up. There is also a new mode, it's called the supervisor mode, but we do not really need to care about this one, as you will see, the firmware will change back into system mode anyways. So it, it first checks some uh, exception vectors, then it uh, changes into system mode, and then it calls um, a function that we labeled the setup function of the chip. It is actually used to initialize some basic processor registers and some basic memory locations, and then it is actually calling a function called cmain, which is, in the end, your main function that is, yeah, the basic function that is called when you start the firmware. It will do some, some stuff, and as maybe we want to already debug those, um, this code uh, that is executed by the cmain function, it would make sense to initialize our board stack um, before going into the cmain function. To do this, we simply hook the cmain function and after, at the end of our hook, we just uh, call the original cmain function. <coughs> so um, during the hook, we want to, to call a function that we implement in C. And um, to do this, we use a branch link instruction. Of course, we have to um, save some registers when we do this, because the branch link will override our link register. So we push it on the stack and pop it afterwards. And also, um, according to the calling conventions, registers 0 to 3 can be overwritten, so we also have to push them. So after doing this, we can uh, call the set abort stack pointer function. And this function we implemented in C due to the Nextmont framework that can easily be done. Um, here we just um, create a new um, array that um, contains memory for our stack. And um, to, to set the abort mode um, uh, stack register, we have to uh, change into abort mode first, then uh, take the value of our, or the address of our uh, stack abort um, array that we initialized before, and uh, push it onto um, the, uh, no, save it into the stack pointer register, and then switch back into system mode. And that's everything we need to do to initialize uh, the stack pointer. So the next thing we, we do is to, to look into the handle exceptions function to, to figure out how exceptions are normally handled on the Wi-Fi chip. So let's go back to this code here. Um, so whenever a breakpoint is called, the prefetch abort handler will be called. So we do it here. And I will just replace this um, code with the code that we were writing in, in our implementation of this handler to, to figure out what is what is happening here. So the first instruction actually um, subtracts four from the link register. And when you enter the abort mode exception, the link register will contain the, um, the address of the program counter at the, um, at the time when the, the breakpoint was hit, uh, plus four, so to get the the address of where the breakpoint was hit, we just subtract four. 
the next instruction is again the uh, store return address to stack pointer. We just uh, store the uh, return state um, onto the abort mode stack. Then we uh, push one register as a, as a placeholder. Then we, we push the link register of the abort stack. And then we um, keep some space for other values. And then we just uh, push the register from 0 to 7 so that, that they are stored on the stack. So those are the original register values um, that uh, contain the, the values of the registers at the time when the breakpoint happened. Now the next instruction um, saves um, a value that is the exception ID. So depending on which exception was called before, there will be a different ID. And the ID3 just um, relates to a prefetch abort exception so that our handle exceptions function knows which kind of uh, exception actually triggered this um, handle exception execution that we will look at at the next slide. So what is happening here? Um, we are just pushing some additional registers about the, the processor state, the exception ID, and the, the PC of the system mode uh, to the stack. Then we are saving some additional registers so that in the end, our abort mode stack now contains the complete processor state at the time when the breakpoint was triggered. So, and then, there is a function um, that we can use to choose an exception handler. And uh, before I go into this function, I will first continue with the execution of the uh, handle exceptions function. And as you can see here, after handling those exceptions, we can actually restore the original registers according to the value saved on the stack. And then we can call the RFE instruction. It's called the return from exception instruction. It will restore the program counter and the processor state, and then continue execution, which is pretty nice. Because after calling such an exception, we can just continue with the regular operation of our, of our firmware. Normally, this kind of exception handler is also used for fast interrupts. They are normally used for handling, for example, uh, timer interrupts, or for example, if you receive a Wi-Fi frame, the DMA transfers the data into the RAM and then triggers an exception to, to handle this data. This is always done by triggering the fast interrupt. And so this exception handler will, will handle this event and then return with the normal processor operation. So now let's look into the uh, choose exception handler function. In the original firmware, it is not a function. It is just uh, executing some code you will see on the next slide. But to make it a little bit easier extendable, I, I created a, a function for it. So in this function, you can see here that there are some comparisons. For example, it compares the, the register 0 that contains the exception ID with the value 6, which indicates a fast interrupt. That means it's an interrupt from your DMA or your timer, for example. and only if this interrupt was called, we will, we will handle this fast interrupt. Otherwise, uh, the, the processor will trigger a trap. That means it will dump the register state and um, yeah, go into a while zero loop to, to stop execution. So whenever there is something else than a fast interrupt exception, uh, for example, the, the prefetch abort exception due to a breakpoint, the processor will just stop and not do anything else. And what we want to do is to actually handle this um, uh, prefetch abort exception to handle our breakpoint and then continue execution. So to do this, we first check if uh, we have a prefetch abort exception, which is the case when the value is set to 3. And then we can jump to our own code that will call a function that is handling the prefetch abort exception. So another nice thing here is that um, we store the address of the where the stack pointer is currently pointing at into register 0. And register 0 is the first argument passed to a function. That means whenever we call this function, we directly have the address on, on the stack where the trace is. And as, you, as I already showed you on the last slide, um, the values that are saved on this stack, they will be restored 
before going back into a regular firmware execution. That means if we want to change some values of the registers that will be restored, we can just change them here on the stack, and we know that they will be loaded when continuing the program execution. So two things we, we need to do first when we, when we enter our prefetch abort exception handler function. Um, we push two registers as now we are in the abort uh, operating mode of the processor. So we pushed the uh, link register and the stack pointer values of the abort mode to the stack. We have to, to fix this to get the original values from the from the system mode, and to do this, we call a little function called uh, fix uh, SPLR. Therefore, we first um, disable the debugger, go into system mode. Then, when we are into system mode, we can just copy the values of our stack pointer and the link register into two other registers, like R1 and R2. Then, we go back into abort mode, enable debugging again, and then we can uh, store those register values on in our trace. Now the next thing we need to do is to, to handle a breakpoint. So the simplest option to do this is um, done in this very small program. So you see, handling a breakpoint is nothing magical. It's very simple in the end. Um, what is happening here is uh, on the right you can see a, a very simple example program, just two move instructions and a branch to, to loop through the program. We set a breakpoint on the second instruction. So we first execute the first instruction, then we go to the next instruction with the breakpoint. Before executing this instruction, we change into our um, prefetch abort exception handler, and then we, we just check for every breakpoint that can be set if um, the breakpoint is active. If it is active, we go um, to, to a next check, and we check whether the the address of the, the breakpoint is actually the address of the uh, program counter when the um, exception was triggered. And if this is the case, we know that the breakpoint we are currently checking for was triggered at this particular breakpoint. Then we can implement um, whatever code we want to, to, to analyze this breakpoint. So we can, we can just dump register values, we can change register values, or do whatever we want. And then we have to disable our breakpoint. And then we can continue execution of the firmware. That means we are going back to the instruction that had the breakpoint set. We execute it and then continue execution, which is something pretty nice. Unfortunately, um, in some situations, you might want to set a breakpoint, handle it, and reset a breakpoint at the very same address. So you do not want to delete it. That is something we will do next. And after doing this, we will also want to do single stepping. That means if we uh, had a breakpoint on one instruction, we want to break also on the next instruction and the instruction after that. I will also show you how this works. So first, look into uh, handling and resetting breakpoints. So the simplest thing you might think about would be to just um, remove the call to disable the, the breakpoint. But if we now just uh, execute the program, so we go into the breakpoint handler, we execute the instructions, but do not reset the breakpoint, then if we continue execution, we will come back to the same instructions where we were before, and as there is a breakpoint, we will call our breakpoint handler again. This is something that we do not really want to do, because now we are somehow in, a, in an endless breakpointing loop. So we have to find another option to, to handle and reset those breakpoints. To do this, we can do the following. So this is a little bit uh, different code here. Again, we first check if the breakpoint is enabled. We check if the, the address of the breakpoint is equal to the program counter's address. We handle the breakpoint. And then we use a, uh, we use a variable to remember which breakpoint was hit. And then instead of... Um, instead of resetting or disabling the breakpoint, we say we create a new breakpoint, which is an instruction mismatch breakpoint. So it will not trigger the breakpoint on this instruction, but on any other instruction that can be executed. So I indicated with a, with a green dot here, 
this is an instruction mismatch breakpoint, and if we continue firmware execution, it will not break on exactly this instruction, but it will break on the next instruction and enter our, our uh, breakpoint handler again. The nice thing about those instruction mismatch breakpoints is if you, for example, um, have a breakpoint on a conditional branch, branch instruction that might have different outcomes, for example, a target address or the next instruction, by using the address mismatch breakpoint, you will always break on the next instruction. doesn't matter where it is. So you do not need to worry about where to set the next breakpoint. So um, if we now check whether the, the program counter's address is the address of the breakpoint, we will see that this check fails and we go into our else path. And here we check if we previously remembered that the breakpoint was set before. And if this is the case, we just change our breakpoint back into an instruction match breakpoint. That means it is a regular breakpoint. And then we, we forget about that uh, this breakpoint was set before and continue our execution. That means we are, we are now at the, the next instruction. There is no instruction mismatch breakpoint anymore. So we can simply execute it. We can e execute the next instruction, then trigger our breakpoint again, and we have a debugger that can automatically reset breakpoints. So the next thing we want to do is to implement single stepping to break on every instruction and maybe dump information on every state of the processor, uh, to, to trace a program, for example, if you enter a function, you want to know which path the, the program takes through the function. So you can simply do this by doing single stepping and just, for example, printing the PC address. So how does this work? We again check for the breakpoint, for the correct address. We handle the breakpoint. Um, we remember that we set it and we, we, do an, in, we change it to an instruction mismatch. Then we continue execution and then we go to our next instruction. And on this one, we again go into the else path. Then we can handle our, our first uh, single stepping breakpoint. And then we do something which is um, setting a new instruction mismatch breakpoint on the current program counters address. So we're just moving this instruction mismatch breakpoint. And now it will break on this instruction. Uh, no, it will not break on this instruction, but on any other instruction like this one. And so we can go on doing this for as long as we want to, to be able to implement single stepping on a processor. And as it is a freely programmable debugger, you can add any conditions to stop the debugging. For example, you can say, I want to do 20 steps to dump PC values and then do something else, or I check a register and say only if this value equals something else, I will stop single stepping or whatever you can imagine. Okay, so now we, we learned about how to, how to set uh, breakpoints and how to, no, we didn't learn how to set them, we only learned how to handle them and how to use some predefined functions here to, to set them. But the next thing is, how do we actually activate breakpoints? And to do this, we, we took another look into the technical uh, reference manual of the ARM processor. And then you can see that uh, the debugging core has a couple of memory mapped registers. And only a couple of them are interesting for us. The first one is uh, the debug uh, state and control register. It is important because here you can set which kind of debugging mode should be activated, either the halting debugging mode or the monitor debugging mode. We are, of course, in the last one because we, are, we want the processor to create exceptions whenever in a breakpoint is triggered. And then we have um, a breakpoint value register. It contains the address uh, for the breakpoints where, where it should hit. And then we have a breakpoint control register. And this one just gives some more information about the breakpoint. One very important parameter of this uh, register is called M for whatever meaning. Oh, no, it's, it's the meaning of the the value stored in the uh, breakpoint value register. And here you can, for example, say that it is an instruction match uh, breakpoint or an instruction mismatch breakpoint. So with 
those registers, you can actually define everything we need for setting our breakpoints that I presented you before. The problem here is, um, as you can see here, the, the breakpoint registers are mapped into the memory of the Wi-Fi chip. However, they can, depending on the implementation, they can be mapped to different locations. And currently, we do not know where those registers are. So we somehow have to figure out how to, to find those registers. So let's uh, look at the memory map of uh, a Wi-Fi chip. And we already know that at the beginning, there's uh, the ROM is mapped into the memory. At a higher address, the RAM will be mapped. And at a very high address, uh, there, is, uh, there are memory map peripherals. And they also contain um, addresses for the, for the debugging core registers. However, we do not know where they are. But if you look again into the reference manual, you can see that there are certain instructions that you can call to communicate with coprocessors of this ARM chip. And one of those coprocessors in the end is the debugging core. And there's a coprocessor instruction that gives you the debug ROM address, which is actually the address where the debugging registers are mapped into memory. So by calling this assembler instruction and damping the value, we figured out that the, the debugging core registers should be mapped to, to this address here. So this was the first challenge we had to, to, to meet to, um, to get access to the debugging core, but there are some more stones in our way. The first one is debugging registers on the ARM process processors are normally not directly accessible. So to, to avoid you from accidentally writing values into those registers and destroying the processor state, you always have to first unlock access to those registers. And therefore, another register exists, which is the uh, lock access register. And you have to write a magic value into this register to be able to uh, unlock those registers. So on the next slide, we will try to access those registers. And we will just write this value into the register to see if it works to, to unlock the, the breakpoint registers. So this is something we remember up here. OK. So to do this, um, I will show you a little bit how we did it and where we failed during our, during our firmware patching. So first of all, whenever the firmware starts, it, it first does some hardware initialization stuff. Then it will enable uh, interrupts. And then it will go to sleep and wait for interrupts to occur so that they can be handled. And one way to trigger an, an interrupt is to send an IO CTL message, which is some kind of a control message for the Wi-Fi firmware from the host to the Wi-Fi chip. This will wake up the chip, and the IO CTL can be handled. So the first thing we tried was just to send a custom IO CTL and extend uh, the IO CTL, CTL handler with our custom IO CTL handler. And he, we just tried to write this magic value into the log access register. However, the firmware crashed. So this raised two questions. Uh, the first one was, um, why can't we access the debugging registers? even though it should be possible, the addresses should be right. The other question that came up following this is, if there are even a debugging core available in this chip? So we did some more testing. And um, we tried to, to access those debugging registers directly at the beginning of the, the hardware initialization. So when hooking the C main function, we directly tried to write into those uh, debugging log registers. And the firmware kept running. That means somehow we can access the debugging registers at the beginning of the hardware initialization phase. However, if we try to access it at the end of the initialization phase, the firmware crashes. That means somewhere in between, uh, access to the debugging core registers will be broken. So after a lot of. Uh, different firmware patches where we tried to write into those debugging registers, we figured out that there is a function uh, 
that before calling this function, debugging uh, works. After calling this function, we cannot access the debugging registers anymore. So we narrowed it in to this particular function call here. And by knocking the function call, um, we can even set breakpoints after, after this point. That means this particular function call is somehow disabling the debugging core and um, therefore restricts the access to those debugging registers, which lets the, the firmware crash. So we finally figured out how debugging works, and now we can access our debugger, debugging registers from any point we want to. So let's uh, continue with our to-do list. Um, we almost managed everything except of the activation of the breakpoints. So this is what we will do on the next slide. So to, to activate breakpoints, um, we just hook the cmain function and, and call our own set debug registers function. And the, the first thing we need to do is, of course, unlock the debugging registers. Then we, just for safety, disable all for debugging, debugging registers. And then we enable monitor debugging mode. And then we can start setting our, our breakpoints. Of course, you can also do it at a later point in time, but here's a, a good place to do it. That means, in this example, we just set a breakpoint uh, at the beginning of the printf function. And I already told you, I, I also, we can also set watch points. It's very similar to setting breakpoints, so I didn't explain it in detail here. But this, break, uh, this watch point should, for example, trigger whenever a certain uh, address in memory is, is either loaded or written. And uh, we just point it to a certain string that is, that is uh, output on the, the, the chip's console whenever you, you start the chip. So let's, uh, let's see what um, we can achieve by, by running a firmware that has this breakpoint and the watch point set. So this is the output you can see at the chip's internal console. So first of all, uh, here's the, the string written on which we set the, the memory watch point. And here you can see that um, the watch point handler triggers twice because it is somehow accessed two times at a certain location of the, the program counter. So if, for example, you have some, you have a certain um, memory location, you want to know which function accesses this memory location, you can simply set a watch point like this to figure out where the code is that um, accesses your, your memory. Uh, the next thing uh, is the breakpoint down here. So I said I wanted to uh, trigger the breakpoint whenever the, the printf function is used. So you might ask yourself, um, why is it only triggered here and not before? Because as we, we know, we have a, a programmable debugger, and I programmed it just to trigger if the argument of the first register is set to a certain string. So as you can see here, you can have a very nice um, programmable debugger implemented directly on your Wi-Fi chip. So the next is, uh, of course, you can run this debugger on your own. Uh, everything is open source. So on the one hand, the, the Nextmon framework and uh, the debugger. Uh, if you want to try it out, you can simply go to our repository at nextmon.org. You clone the repository. There you will find some kind of a, a structure of different directories. We have some build tools, which, for example, contain a compiler. We have um, firmwares, for example, for the BCM4339, but also for many other Wi-Fi chips. Then we have a patches directory. It contains subdirectories for different chips and subdirectories for different firmware versions. And under there, we can, um, we can have multiple different patches. For example, our Nextmon patch will enable monitor mode and frame injection, for example, on a couple of your smartphones. It also works on Raspberry Pis. So if you ever need this feature, you can use Nextmon for this. We have a make file to, to execute some, some commands for you and um, something to set up the environment so that our build system finds the compiler and so on. So to, to try the debugger, you just uh, clone this repository into the, the subdirectory of, the, of the, the firmware for the Nexus 5. 
It contains uh, a couple of source files. A patch file is always used to basically initialize the nextmon patch. Then we have a debugger base file, which is always the same for any debugging project you want to work on. It contains some common patches, for example, for patching the handle exceptions function. And then it contains a debugger.c file where we actually handle our, um, our breakpoints. Then a make file to, to build the firmware and a linker file to somehow describe where certain functions should be linked. So to, to try it out, you just uh, go into the, the nextmon base directory, run make, source the uh, setup environment file, and uh, go into the, the patch directory, run make install firmware, and it will be installed on an Access 5 smartphone connected to your computer. So uh, on the next slides, I will uh, quickly go over um, how the Nextmon framework works, in case you, you do not know the firmware framework yet. As you saw uh, in the last talk, it is not only possible to patch firmware for Wi-Fi chips, but also for other devices. So it might also be interesting for you for patching other firmwares. So I will first present a way how, to, how firmware patching can be done. So assume you, you figured out some, some functions and how the firmware works, and then you start writing patches. You can write your patches in an assembler file, assemble the file to get out a binary file, and then you can use some different tools like Python scripts or something to patch your binary um, code into the firmware file. But for us, this was not uh, the way to go because on the one hand, assembly, I mean, writing assembly code is very tedious and error prone. On the other hand, um, it wasn't sufficient to just write instructions into the assembler file. We also had to modify the, the Python scripts uh, to, to define where functions defined in assembler should be placed in the firmware and so on and so forth. So it was very tedious. Therefore, we started working on our Nextmon patching framework. It's a C-based patching framework. That means all the code that we have and all the placement instructions, they are stored in C files. And they can be simply compiled into object files. And um, to figure out where certain functions should be placed, we created a, a GCC plugin, the Nextmon GCC plugin, and it, it extracts those uh, address information and stores them in a simple text file. So how does it look like? For example, if we have this assembler code here, it's one part of the Wi-Fi firmware. Uh, as you can see here, it loads a string into register zero. Then it loads a second string into register one, which will replace this uh, string variable in this format string here. And then it will call a function, which is most likely the printf function. So in case if you want to uh, if we want to patch this function call, which is called with a branch link instruction, we can use one of our branch link patches. It first has a name for our hook so that you can find it while debugging the, the patch in your linker files and so on. And it will contain the name of a target function that you want to call instead of the original function. And then to say where to place this patch, we can uh, add an attribute, an add attribute, uh, it contains the, the address on which we want to place the, the branch link patch. Um, as you can see here, the, the address is actually in ROM of the Wi-Fi firmware. It is also possible on Broadcom chips to patch a certain number of uh, locations in ROM by doing something we call a flash patch. So you can just define here that this patch should be implemented as a flash patch, and then you can define for which chip version and for which firmware version this, chip, uh, this uh, patch should work. And then you can just run your C compiler and uh, generate patches for, for, different, um, yeah, for different systems. Okay, let's go on with the patching process. Uh, based on our extracted uh, address information in this text file here, we create linker files uh, that describe where functions should be placed. And we also have make files that, that are just, in the end, we use them as some kind of scripts to define um, which parts of, an, of a binary file should be extracted and placed somewhere in the firmware. So then we use the linker to, to place the, the objects stored here um, at the addresses where they should appear in the firmware. This results in an ELF file. And using the make files, we extract those binary sections for functions and variables. 
uh, into binary files that we can patch into the firmware to get our patched firmware. So another thing about patch placement, um, if we have an instruction like this, it is very simple to, to place it because we are just overwriting an, in, in an instruction at a certain memory location. But here in our branch link patch, we say we want to call the target function name function. So we look at this target function name function, and um, it is just implementing some kind of hook. Uh, we can do something with the parameters passed here, and so on and so forth. But what you might ask yourself is, where, where should we place those functions that we develop on our own? Um, so one, one property of the linker is, uh, we can tell the linker to collect all functions that are not especially placed at a certain location in just a certain memory region. And with another pragma that we added, for it's called the target region pragma, we can say in which memory region all functions that are not explicitly placed should be, should be collected. And this is, for example, here in the patch region. So if you write your own patches with C code, you can just do everything automatically, collect those functions in, in certain memory regions, and so on and so forth. So to, to actually uh, place those functions in, in the firmware, we, we were lucky starting our reverse engineering with the Nexus 5 because at the very beginning there was some free memory uh, which was large enough to contain a couple of patches and it was never overwritten during firmware runtime. So we started to, to place the firmware there. However, on other, uh, on other Broadcom chips, uh, there was no part that was always kept free. So we had to find another way to, to place uh, our firmware patches. And one thing is that um, I already presented you before in the, on the first slides that each Wi-Fi chip also has um, a second core uh, that is somehow interfacing the hardware in real time. Uh, on Broadcom chips, this is a, a second processor installed in, in the Wi-Fi chips, and it also has a firmware that has to be loaded into the chip. Uh, this uh, special real-time processor is called D11 core, and the firmware for this D11 core is embedded into the, the ARM firmware image. So somewhere in the ARM firmware, you can find this D11 core firmware. So we figured out that it is very easy to compress this firmware, so we just started to compress the firmware and uh, change the code for, for loading the D11 firmware to directly decompress it on the fly. And now we have some additional free uh, memory in our Wi-Fi firmware that we can use to place our own patches. Something we have to um, uh, take care of is uh, the following. Normally, after loading the D11 core firmware, the memory region is not used anymore because we only need to load the D11 core firmware once, so it will be assigned to the heap. So one thing we need to make sure is that um, the path that we use for our patches will not be assigned for the heap. So this is uh, all, uh, my little overview about the Nextmod firmware patching framework. On the next slide, I, I have some uh, applications that are, that are built on this patching framework. So for example, um, last year we, we built a, a reactive jammer for Wi-Fi systems on smartphones. Um, it lets you analyze incoming Wi-Fi frames while they are being received and while they are still being transmitted, then decide whether we want to uh, jam those signals so we can generate our own arbitrary waveform jamming signals and trigger a transmission to disturb the reception of those Wi-Fi frames. So it is not a deauthentication jammer, but it is a real physical layer jammer you can implement on your smartphone. We even have an, an app to to demonstrate it, you can also try it out using Nex um, Nexus 5 smartphones. And another nice thing here is we can also generate arbitrary waveforms. So in the end, we can use our Wi-Fi chip in a similar fashion as a software-defined radio. So you can actually send out any signals you would like. So another app that you can also get on the, the Google Play Store is our Nexmon pen penetration testing app. Uh, it uses the monitor mode and frame injection features to run some applications like an error dump view or Wireshark dissection, a couple of attacks directly from your 
pocket in the end. Um, the app is a little bit outdated, so if you want a newer version with support for, for more chips and so on, just build it on your own from our Nextman repository. Yeah, we also patch firmwares for 802.11 AD devices um, that are Wi-Fi chips that are operating in the 60 gigahertz band. And the source code and everything for all of those projects you can find on our website. As you saw in the last talk, we also have third-party applications that are, that are based on the Nextmon framework. For example, uh, to, to patch firmwares in the Xiaomi ecosystem. And there is the possibility to, to patch firmwares for fitness trackers. For, for example, for the Fitbit, uh, there was a presentation, or there, there's a, a publication that will show how, to, how you can change your Fitbit firmware so that if you are just moving the, the device a little bit, it will just count up steps in, in steps of 100 instead of just counting up by one. Uh, and it is, it is using the original um, Fitbit app, it is using an, an encrypted uh, Fitbit device, so we just replaced the firmware and can yeah, trick Fitbit into believing that we are running pretty fast. Yeah, if you are interested in more project, uh, more projects, I will defend my PhD this at the end of February, and there we will have some some more topics, all based on the next month firmware patching framework. If you are interested in it, um, we can also talk about it over lunch. Um, if I would had some more time, I would have presented you the Gemma application in more detail, but as we do not have more time, I will just continue. And that's the end of my talk. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Questions? I actually have two questions. First one, um, so you have a stack for each mode. So it's pro possible to allocate more elements, or not allocate, but put more elements on the stack and overflow the uh, adjacent regions? Uh, that depends on where you place the stacks in the memory, I suppose. You mean for, for doing some kind of an attack on the, on the system, uh, a stack overflow? Yeah. I mean, when implementing the debugger, I didn't really care about where to, to place the stacks. I just wanted to get the debugger running. And I think normally in, in normal operation, you, you, wouldn't, um, yeah, you, you wouldn't have the, the debugging firmware running on your phone. So I think that, that shouldn't be a problem to overflow the stack if you are just debugging your application on your own. But you don't have stacks per default, which are there because there's firmware and then... So, so normally the firmware is always operated in system mode, so there's only one stack. Yeah. And second question is, why do you need a bridge between Ethernet and Wi-Fi? Okay, the, the thing is, uh, normally you have those uh, full Mac Wi-Fi chips installed in smartphones as they are a bit more energy saving. So normally your, your main processor in the smartphone can run in idle mode while your Wi-Fi chip is, for example, controlling the connection to the access point. But it does not need to wake up the main processor for every incoming frame that should be handled. So therefore, we have those full Mac chips. And um, yeah, it is somehow easier to just exchange only Ethernet frames and not care about the current Wi-Fi state in the operating system because all the Wi-Fi handling is just happening in the Wi-Fi chip. Hello. Sorry, it wasn't clear for me. How do you get the messages from the debugging output? Oh, um, you just call a command on Android smartphones that is called dhdutil, pass the argument console dump, and it will dump the console. Okay. The, so the console is just written into memory into a certain region, and um, yeah, over the inter interface between host and um, Wi-Fi chip, you can directly dump it from there. Hi, uh, thanks, great, great talk. Uh, I have a question about how do you manage to update your patch on, uh, on the Broadcom ship? 
I, I mean, how do you update the, the chip? Uh, the, the, the firmware? Sorry. Yes, the firmware, yeah. yes. Uh, the firmware is not signed, uh, okay. so it's just the firmware binary lying somewhere in the operating system. Okay. If you have root privileges, you can just override the firmware file, and next time the driver loads it, it will load your okay. firmware file. Okay. Simple. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Thank you, Matthias. Oh, oh there was another yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you tried writing a GDB server stub for interactive debugging. Um, but what what do you mean with interactive debugging? Uh, so GDB server stub, a small component that runs on the target that you can attach okay. GDB to. Um, yeah, I mean this would be more the halting mode debugging because you would really stop the operation of the chip and then give control to an external debugging program. Um, we didn't want to do this. I mean, we might might be able to do it, but for the, the real-time chip, I think it's easier to just handle all the debugging directly in the chip because it's also faster uh, compared to halting the chip, uh, waiting for an external program to do something that might take a couple of milliseconds or seconds. If you handle all your debugging events directly in the Wi-Fi chip, it is much faster and even if you have some real-time operation, it doesn't too much disturb the original firmware execution. Then, thanks for listening. Thank you, Matthias.